Thousands of kids were ran through Carlisle Institute. And this is in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And anybody that wants to look into the boarding school history, because I can guarantee you there are Warm Springs tribal members that attended Carlisle. And they have the best online records. They also had an alumni association. So high school young people learned to read cursive writing because maybe your ancestors wrote letters back to Carlisle and they're done in, in cursive writing. And so I was able to find some amazing documents written by family members as part of the Alumni Association of Carlisle. They also have every single student's card um, that says when they registered, their age, their blood quantum, and the Indian agency that they came from. Some of them have um, like, gen, uh, like maybe dad's name, mom's name, that sort of information. And so they have amazing records. Very terrible place, but currently has good records. This is the motto of the Indian schools. Kill the Indian, save the man. And to say that that's 100% accurate, that's pretty 100% accurate. Everything that was native in these people that they could kill out, stomp out, that's exactly what they did to preserve the man and the woman that would come out at the end. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to do a brief simulation and understanding something that hopefully we will never truly understand. And that's what it's like to be taken and to have your culture erased. And so just for a second, I want you to think about what you have with you on your person. Probably got your cell phone, you might have your backpack or your purse. You might have on some jewelry. I want you to think about if I told you Everybody bring every single thing you have right here, and you're gonna sit here and watch it burn. Just think about that for a minute. Like, oh, what do I have in my back? Oh my God, I went to the bank and I got cash. You're gonna sit here and watch that burn. I hate to admit it, I'm up to almost 10,000 pictures on my cell phone. I'm gonna watch that burn. Those are material things. How would you feel watching everything you have burn right here? And this is at a time when you didn't go to you know, Fred Myers and buy your pants and your shirt. That was made for you by somebody that loved you. And you're gonna sit here and watch it burn. What does that do to your sense of identity? Maybe it's a wedding ring. At this time it could have been you know, an eagle feather that was bestowed upon you. It would be something of value. And we're gonna strip you of that. And we're all gonna sit here. Does anybody want to share one thing that they would be saddest to watch burn right this second? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's also your connection. That's your connection to your family, your friends. If you ran out of gas right here, you would probably use that phone and dial for help. Okay? That connection would be lost. That's what happened to natives when they would go to boarding school. Secondly, we all make uh, specific choices when it comes to our hair. Native people's hair is sacred. They believe that there is strength in their hair. And I, I just, I'm new to TikTok. I've been watching TikTok for about two months now. And I frequently see these little kids and their moms are doing their hair and they're saying daily affirmations. You are strong, you are fierce, you know, those sorts of things. Native parents have been doing this to their children for hundreds of years. Frequently, when a parent is braiding a child's hair, they will bless them and pray for them. Those are affirmations that have just become the it thing, you know, in the last two years. Native people have been doing that forever. And what would happen when they would get to boarding school is they would cut their hair. And this is happening to kids. Maybe they may be six years old, they may be 16 years old, but they don't know what's going on because everything's happening in, other, in another language. And frequently when you cut your hair, it means that there has been death in your family and you were in mourning. So the wails that would come from the barber would go all the way down the halls and everybody in the school could hear it. Because the only thing they could associate was they had been taken from their family and from their tribes, so they would assume that there had been mass deaths for them to be all be having their hair cut because they didn't know what was happening because it was in a different language. And so think about if you had to have your hair cut today by force and what that would do to your identity and how you would feel. 
And the last thing I asked my students to think on is when they were taken to boarding school, they never knew how long they were going to be there. So if you went in at the age of six, there was a likelihood you would not come out until you were 20. They did not know. So I want you to think, if you were taken forcefully from this room today, who would not be here in the next five to 15 years that you would never be able to say goodbye to? Would it be a grandmother, a grandfather, a sick relative, or a spouse? That's what these children had to face. They didn't know who was going to be gone when they came back. And remember, this is at a time where diseases would run rampant. So if a disease hit a tribe, you know, 80% of the tribe would be gone. And these kids are going to be away for an undetermined amount of time. And so who would you be saddest to possibly lose? And this is just a very, very brief simulation. And we all know it's not real. But think about it for a couple seconds and tell me what would have been the greatest thing that you have lost. This was the reality of our grandparents, okay? of your great, great grandpa. This is probably what happened. Okay, and it's some heavy stuff. And we are literally just playing pretend. And it weighs heavy. This was their reality. So when they arrived at school, um, another thing they would frequently do, is there would be a board like this, and they would have John, Sally, Jim, you know, the easy names, and they would have to come up and pick a name off a board. In native culture, frequently a name is earned or bestowed. This was another way to wipe away the culture. And so, they, they would have their clothes changed into a military uniform, their hair cut, and their name changed. And then students were frequently sent to schools far away from their homelands. So let's say a 1900, a 10 year old in Warm Springs, gets lost between here and Saliva Falls. I am betting that 10 year old could survive at least a week, because they would have been trained to do that. However, if I took that same 10 year old and I stuck him in Oklahoma, would he be able to survive for a week? Probably not. Would he just gather strength from seeing the mountains and the sun and the things that he was familiar with, from walking on ground that his ancestors had been on? The land is our strength, so they would intentionally put them <clears throat> far away from their homes. Um, so there were, I would say, probably out of the nine federally recognized tribes, I would say the most tri um, tribal members that went to the schools in Oregon were from Warm Springs, from the records that I have seen, from the Confederated Tribes. The second Indian school, federal Indian school, to open up was in Forest Grove in 1880. And the, these are some pictures. This is a carpentry class, and this one is a, no, this one's shoemaking, and that one's carpentry class. And these images are of, um, they were like advertisement images that they did. And then the girls, they would do vocational and academics. But the second school, it was in um, Forest Grove for the first five years, and then it moved to Chamawa after that. And Chamawa today is the longest running boarding school in existence. Okay. And something a lot of people don't know is these children ran everything. So can you imagine being 10 years old and you go to school all day, you take your normal reading, writing, math, or arithmetic. I said math twice. Um, <laughs> but then after you're done with that, you would do your religious services. And then you would have to go out and make your shoes. Or you would have to go out and tend the garden to grow your own food. Students were in charge of everything from the food they ate to the buildings that they lived in. Children built them all. Children built the Ch Chamawa campus. And so then after that, if they were actually all done with their work, then the children would be rented out to work. And so there is frequent stories of students from Chenawa being rented out to help on pasture land in the valley. So they were not paid for, I don't use the word slavery, because that's a really loaded word, but the children were not paid for their labor. This is a picture that I found. Um, there's an archivist, her name is Eva Gugamos, and she is um, archivist at Seattle Pacific, and she's writing a book on the Forest Grove Indian School. 
and she has excellent documentation. So if anybody wants to look into it, this is one of the photos that I got off of her webpage. And this is a group of Paiute Was Wasco Warm Springs Indians. And I've tried to dig into the Chamalva files and they don't have the names on the backs of the pictures. So it's really hard to know who's who. So if you look like somebody in this photo, you're probably related. Um, but I don't have the specific names of the people. Um, this one is Sir Peter, uh, I think this is spelled wrong because when I look at the written records, it doesn't have two M's. And um, I think they have her down as Fanny Pitt. And they both attended um, Forest Grove and Chamawa. And this is actually a picture of them here on the Warm Springs Reservation. They got married while they were at Chamawa and then moved back to Warm Springs. And they have, when you dig into these documents, they have really good information. And his grandfather was actually half Hawaiian and was part of the Hudson Bay Trading Company. And that's how he ended up in the Pacific Northwest. Her, she's actually Pitt River. And the Warm Springs were born with the Pitt River. Her great-grandfather was taken as a slave by the Warm Springs, was then sold to a white man, and she was raised in Warm Springs, and then attended Chinawa. And they have all this information online, just free for the taking. Mm -hmm. I thought those are really cool stories. Mm -hmm. You never know where you come from, because this is not easy to find this information. I, I did it for you guys, you can thank me later. <laughs> um, but it's, just, it's cool to kind of, I was like, how did Native Hawaiian end up in Oregon at Chamel? That's how. By 1926, the Indian office estimates that 80% of Indian school aged children were attending boarding schools. And I want to make something very clear. When you hear 83%, that's a lot. You know, that's over 8 and 10. This was not because Indian parents did not love their babies and did not fight as hard as they could. If you refuse to give up your children, you could be held in jail. They would frequently pull your rations. And remember, natives are stuck on reservations at this time, often intentionally, I say intentionally, because I do believe it was intentionally, being held to become dependent on the federal government and the ration system. And so natives were starving in their own communities. So some natives are like, the best chance for my child, as much as I don't like it, is for them to go to this school. And so there's even pictures, I have a great picture of teepees set up outside of Carlisle because the parents refused to let their children go and followed and camped outside the school. So even though this says 83%, that's not because those child were, children were given, it's because they were taken. And this is just one generation. And I was talking to the gentleman here and I came upon my boarding school journey um, for a couple of reasons. First, my grandmother, Marilyn Hall, attended Haskell Indian School in Lawrence, Kansas. At the age of 12, she was separated from her two younger sisters. Lolly and Vera were sent to Stewart Indian School in Nevada, and my grandma was sent by herself to Haskell, Kansas. And I'm mad at about a lot of things, but I'm most upset. I spent 13 years in the court system. You're never supposed to break up siblings. And they did it on purpose, I believe. Because what makes you strong? Your family makes you strong. So we'll make you weak by taking you away from your family. And then another way we'll weaken you is once you get there, we'll take you away from your tribal members who understand where you came from, who speak your language. So they would intentionally break um, the recruits or the students into different groups so that they wouldn't be with tribal members who they could relate to and rely on for strength. And then they would do some really sick and twisted school things. In one of the documentaries, it's actually about the Indian Child Welfare Act, but it talks about boarding schools. And they had these things called a hotline. I had never heard of it. But if you got in trouble, and this was in the boys' side of the camp, they would line all the boys up in two rows, and you would have to strip down naked, and you would have to run through that line, and those Indian boys would beat you with a towel or a whip while you ran through that hot line. And if the kids didn't beat you hard enough, they got beat. Why would they do that as a form of punishment? Why couldn't the teacher just beat them? I didn't conquer. Buddha. <laughs> exactly. They did that to weaken the unity of the native people as a whole. 
And so if you take anything from the presentations or for any time I teach Native history, things did not happen by accident. They were done with purpose and intent. And they did everything they could to break down these children so that they could weaken their culture and weaken their ties. And here's a quick story. And it's a Klamath story because I don't have a Warm Springs one. Um, but this young man, his name is Joe Ball. He's 16 and he's Modoc. And then this is Selden Kirk, voted lifetime chairman of the Klamath tribe for 35 years. This is his older brother Clayton and their dad, Jesse. Reverend Jesse Kirk was a pro proponent of the boarding schools. He strongly believed in them. And the story of these two young men, Clayton and Joe, is they decided they had enough of Carlisle and they decided to run away. Ooh, not for you boys. And they ran and they made it 250 miles. They ran from Carlisle, Pennsylvania to Pittsburgh. That's a good run. If they were running from Chamawa to Warm Springs, they would have made it. They were over 2,000 miles from home, even though they made it 250 miles. So when I say things were done with a purpose and intent, there's a reason they didn't send them to Chamawa, because on that run, those two boys would have made it home. And they didn't make it home. Uh, the two Kirk boys ended up at Phoenix Indian School. I heard some people talking about that. And Joe Ball, you go Joe Ball, because there's plenty of Ball descendants down in Chelequan. He's still listed as a deserter on his transcript. So when you go into the transcripts and you see run or desert, deserter, I say booyah to your family for running and deserting. Um, I taught this presentation Friday. And I was flipping through it on my computer screen in the morning and my five-year-old daughter came down. And she's like, what is that? And I didn't know what to say. So I just kind of sat there. I was like, those are little kids' handcuffs. And she looked at me and she said, what kind of people would want to handcuff little kids? And I just had the struggle in my head. I was like, she's a baby. I don't want to tell people what happened. And I just left it with bad people. Bad people would do that. And I flipped onto my next slide because I wasn't ready to address it with her. And that video I was referencing earlier, I had a colleague I sent it to, and I was like, hey, you need to watch this video. It's really good. She's like, I have a 13 year old daughter. Should I let her watch it? I was like, no, I don't like her not watch it. It's pretty tough stuff. And these are calls I'm making that this is, this is hard stuff. And then I want to check myself. I want to be like, wait, if your daughter was born at a different time, she could be in those hands little Indian kids were. That's why these handcuffs were made, was to hold five-year-old kids like your daughter. And I don't want to talk to my daughter about it, and I have the privilege not to do that, because it's hard stuff. So just let that, I just kind of teared up when I was sitting there, and you tell my daughter, like, what's on the cartoon, you know? She just moved right on. But I was like, I don't have to tell you about this, because you're not born 100 years ago, when this could have been your reality. And it's heavy stuff when you think about it in that tone. And the punishment that went on in boarding schools was beyond anything that we can probably imagine. One of the main punishments was for speaking your language. And that was frequently handled by having your mouth forced out with soap. And there's a Choctaw code talker. Everybody knows about the Navajos, but the Choctaw were the first. They were talking code, what was that? Yeah, the Choctaws were um, talking in World War I. And that's how the whole code talker came into play. And one of the Choctaw code talkers, the very first word he learned in English was soap. Because that's what happened when he talked Choctaw. A Navajo code talker talks about a time where he got talk, caught talking Navajo and he was tied to a radiator in a basement and fed just water for three days for speaking his language. And this is the language that it said that they basically saved the war on the Pacific front. It was beaten out of those children. And so anytime you see a language program for natives, support it with all you have. Because those languages have gone, to speak, that got, gone extinct in many tribes, and it's because of forced, forced assimilation done with intention. And so this is the guardhouse. You know, if we had our COCC campus and we had a jail here, People are like, what you doing at COCC? Like, you need to have handcuffs for your kids. You need to have a jail facility. That would be frowned upon. <laughs> However, it was not for Native students. 
This is again from the research from um, uh, uh, Warm Springs, uh, Chimawa. What differences do you notice in these two pictures? This is the frequent ad campaign that they would use. They would have a before picture and an after picture. Just shout something out. What do you see that's different? Long hair. Long hair. Say it again. Long hair. See, we got to acknowledge our native speakers. Anything else that's different? What was that? The clothing. I think if you just give it a glance, this would be savage versus civilized. Okay. There's something else that's a pretty big difference. This was taken seven months after they arrived, and these students are from Spokane. And about the time they were recruited, there was this great general, a great warrior named Chief Joseph cruising around the Northwest eluding the U.S. Army. So one thing that the boarding schools would do, again, with intention, they would go in and take the tribal leader's children. Are you going to go fight the U.S. government when your baby's sitting here in the government's hands, basically? They use them as weapons against their own parents. This is Marcia Mott. She is the daughter of Chief Mott. She is not in this second picture. This picture is too shy because two kids had died within seven months. Five of these kids are dead by 1888. This is how bad the boarding schools, schools were when it came to illness, okay? We know the discipline was extremely harsh, but the disease and illness within the school was even worse. Here's a letter that I found this morning on the website, and it outlines what happened to the Warm Springs recruiting class. The letter is dated September 26, 1890, and out of 66 students, 22 of them had died. 16 were returned in ill health, but they believe they are still alive. Overall, of the third of the children sent to Forest Grove in Chimawa would end up dying through 1890. Here's a quote. This is from the superintendent of Forest Grove. It has been said that to Educate an Indian is to sign his death warrant. And so think about that for a second. It's more important to educate you and most likely kill you than to just leave you alone. And where it said, how many? 16 of these children were returned. They were returned right here. The most common illness of the time was tuberculosis. Do you not think they knew that knowingly and returned sick children to their tribes, knowing that they would be cared for when they got back? and spread the illness? Why would they do such a thing? Because to have dead kids on the campus was bad publicity. And so they would intentionally send ill children home because they didn't want that on their records. Because it didn't look good. With no thought of what would happen when the children would come back. Indian children were six times as likely to die in childhood while out of boarding school than the rest of the children in America. Oh. Um, the tough one for me. So what I decided to do, I'm part of the Senate Bill 13 committee for my tribe, and I teach Native American studies, I know boarding schools, I'm like, I'll just tweak my lesson and add in some Klamath stuff, like I added in some Warm Springs stuff today, and then I'll give it to my tribe. And so I started researching the Klamath experience at boarding schools. Does so anybody want to give me a guess how that went? Emotional. Oh, extremely emotional. I made it look easy today because I had already found those resources. I searched and searched and can find no resources. You want to know why? Tribes only have 1.5% of Native American records. About 30% of our records are in national archives, which have now been closed for two years. And another big chunk of those records are in church facilities that we don't have access to. So when I was really going to easily just tweak that lesson, that didn't happen. The way I got information was interviewing people because it's not, you just can't find it. I, so I, I went to my culture and heritage and I said, I just need the list of our members that went to boarding school. And Perry Chalked it's like, there is no list. That's what it's like. We don't have our own history. And so I'm making a list. And it's literally like, what would your grandpa's name is what I have to do when I find 
But one of the stories I found, I called Iga Gugumos from Pacific University. She was very kind. I interviewed her for about two hours. And um, I was getting off the phone with her. And I said, Eva, is there anything you wanted to tell me that I forgot to ask? And she said, I've been waiting to talk to somebody from the Klamath tribes. I'm wondering if you know what you guys want to do with the bodies. I'm just a researcher. What are you doing talking to me about bodies? She's like, no, there's bodies in the Chamala Cemetery of your tribal members. Do you know what your tribe wants to do with those? And I was like, no, let me pass that up the chain to you know the important people. And I just, I got kind of quiet and kind of teary. And I was like, oh. And so it was just weighing on me. What am I, what am I gonna tell my, you know, my tribal council about these bodies of kids? And I was like, they gotta know there's some there, but now it's time to make a decision because you know people are finding these bodies and tribes are deciding what to do. And so I finished my curriculum and then I got to do the most amazing thing I've ever done. And I interviewed tribal elders. I interviewed twi uh, 25 tribal elders this summer. It was amazing. And I still have this load on me because I had to decide what to tell tribal council about these kids. And I sat there and I listened to my elders tell me how bad these schools really were. And it was heavy. And I'm right in the tribal council, and I came across, there was 13 clown kids, one Modoc, and one of them was 11-year-old Charlie Feister. Cause of death, gunshot. What? I don't doubt for a second that they would shoot a little kid when he was running away. But to actually admit it, these are the ones that are in the mass unmarked graves, or the gunshot wounds. And I emailed um, the archivist for Chamawa, who's in charge of the, knows a lot about the cemetery. And I was like, Sue Ann, you have got to tell me, how did 11-year-old Charlie, Charlie Feister get shot? And she's a better researcher than I am. This is not Charlie Feister. This is just, I tried to find a good child. Um, and what happened was Charlie was 11 years old at Chamawa, and he ran away from Chamawa and he broke into a store that was attached to the post office in Salem. And the postmaster general shot and killed him. And he's one of those children up in the Chamawa Cemetery. And I'm like, Whoa. And I, it, just, it just weighed really, really heavy on me. And I'm writing to my tribal council, and I'm writing the line, I can't say for certain if Charlie Feister was running home. I can tell you for certain he didn't make it. Is it time to bring him back? And I just started wailing. I mean, I've cried a lot in this project because I thought boarding schools were distant. They were in the past. And you know, you're separated kind of by time and distance. And then you find stories and you listen to elders and it's right there in your living room. And you're not separated from it. You're the survivors of it. And I was just away crying really hard. And I called up my cousin Mandy, who I've been dumping on this whole time. I was like, Mandy, what do I do? I don't want to dump this on tribal council. I don't want to jump it on our general council. They already have such a heavy load. You know, they're dealing with the pandemic. We've had mass fires the last two years. And this is breaking me. What's it going to do to them? And my cousin Mandy, she goes, she's, she's a life flight paramedic. And so she, she puts stuff in her worldview. And she says, Abby, it's like a bone that was broken. For the last hundred years, we have patched it up just to make it through the day. It is time to re-break that bone and heal it. And it sounded really pro prophetic and poetic. I was like, that sounds really cool. It made me feel better. But my tribe and your tribe are going to be breaking this bone when we start finding these cemeteries and these mass grave sites. And literally, you can see, I can't talk about it. And so in the last six months, more has happened with the boarding schools than has happened probably the last 60 years. I'm coming home, I'm coming home. Tell the world I'm coming home. Let the rain wash away all the pain of yesterday. I know my kingdom awaits and they've forgiven.
covering it up. Deb Holland in June did a boarding school initiative where we're supposed to start digging into it. But this is where I have an issue with the boarding school. I don't have an issue with the boarding school initiative. I have an issue with the misunderstanding of what boarding schools were. This is our kind of native people. This is where you go if you want to know something about boarding schools. It's a Native American healing coalition on boarding schools. So they, they say there's 367 boarding schools in 29 different states. And over here when we get to Oregon, they list it, they list all of our, you can't see it, um, but they list our agency schools. So like the Warm Spring Agency School, the Umatilla, and they list those as boarding schools. And then they list Chamawa, Forest Grove, and I think that's it. Since I've been interviewing my elders, I have found, is that my stuff or something else? Okay. Um, I have found, three schools that are not on this list. And it's because I'm talking to the source, the people who have never had their history written until Senate Bill 13 comes along. I have found, I'm gonna click ahead. Uh, this is us doing our interviews. This is Clay Dumont Sr., this is Clay Dumont Jr., and myself, and this is what we did this summer. And how can we begin our healing when the bleeding hasn't stopped. You're still covering it up and not acknowledging what happened. That's, you need to acknowledge it before we can heal from it. I call the Oregon Historical Society. They tell me, as well as the National Registry, that St. Mary's Academy in Albany, Oregon does not exist and was not a boarding school. And my question is, then why do I have a picture outside my education office at my tribe of a bunch of little Indian kids sitting on the steps? Why did I interview three people this summer who attended this as a boarding school? Yet there is not a single documented record that I can find related to Native Americans going here. And so until we dig into what happened in the religious schools, I was actually talking to a researcher from OPB, and I was like, well, you know, my grandma attended Canyonville Bible Academy. That could have been a boarding school. And I got off the phone with them, and I Googled it. Guess what? It was a boarding school. We don't know what we don't know because we're not asking the questions. I had been researching this stuff for six months. My whole life, I knew she had gone to Canyonville. But I also knew that well, my sister went to preschool at the Met church it was probably like that is what I'm telling myself in my head then I got mad at myself how can you be so naive and stupid for not researching this and not knowing that she went to a boarding school before she went to high school and it's because the history is intentionally covered up and there's Mount Angel I interviewed a lady kind of a tribal member living in Warm Springs who attended Mount Angel I have no doubt that Warm Springs tribal members attended Mount Angel which is a boarding school and it is not on the registry. So when you start talking to your elders, that's how you're gonna rewrite your history and learn from it, because that's how I've had to learn. This is a short video from this summer, and it's then, it's not anywhere near its final cut. 
But I think when we think of boarding schools, we think of showing up in a horse and buggy and not speaking English. That's kind of where I had boarding school stuck in my head. This experience took place in the late 1950s, and this is Clay Dumont. We drove on to Albany, and we pulled up in front of this huge home, and my brother and I were both excited because we took, they brought the suitcases out too, and they said, wow, we we're gonna get to spend the night in this big house. Mom and Grandpa took us up, and one of the nuns took my hand, and one of the nuns took my brother's hand, and Mom and Grandpa turned around, went down the stairs, never looked back, my brother started crying and screaming, and he, down he went, said, shut up, up by the hair, and into the door. So this happened within our lifetime. This is a picture of the two DeMont boys. They were six when they went to school. This was taken when they were four or five, and this is their sister who was sent to Mount Angel. Neither of which are in the national radio. Do you think maybe the parents were kind of trying to find schools that were not run by the BIA so that they could maybe save them from that and thinking that the Catholic schools might be somewhat safer health wise? That's a great question. And if you could answer it for me, <laughs> I can tell you in talking to Clay, and I've talked to Clay more about boarding schools than I ever talked to my own grandma who's passed on. And that's his number one question. Why was I chosen? Why was my family chosen? And I can tell you just from our conversations, he would like me to be able to say, I, don't, I, can't, I can't say he would like this. I think it would be easiest for him to hear that his family was paid money to send him there oh. instead of the possibility that, you know, you just, she just shipped you up there. Because both him, he was very close with his grandma. grandpa. And what's not in here is this is the first time they were ever got to go on a highway, you know, and they got to go in the car. It was a big deal to even get in the car. And they got to go on the highway and they went up there and his grandpa didn't look back either, is what hurt him. I think he kind of expected it from his mom. And if I could answer that question, I believe I could give him some healing because this man let himself drive for us for an hour and a half to record his testimony. And he wants to know why he was chosen. I can't answer that for him. He showed up at this school in the 1980s, and he went up and he knocked on the door and he not answered the door. And he said, I used to be a boarder here. Can I look around? She said, you have 30 seconds to get off this premises before I call the cops. He went back 10 years later and the school was gone. That woman had a chance to heal this man. For him to go back as a man and walk to that school and maybe not be so scared. And she took it away and she actively covered it up. And that's why I get angry. And that's why I say the bleeding is still happening. And I haven't been able to answer Clay's question why he was picked. I spent 13 years in the judicial system and I saw sexual predators pick on weak people for a reason. I believe the federal government picked on weak Indians that didn't have the power to fight back and stole their children. And that is a very bold statement and I believe it with all my heart. Okay, there was substance abuse in his family. She was a single mom who was an alcoholic. Do I think the Indian agent knew that and somehow they were single out? I believe so. I don't, you can't find records so I don't know. And I think that's something you have to be willing to accept if you decide to dig into your history is the amount of questions that you can't answer because it's never been written until you come along and do it. And it breaks my heart that I can't. He gave me so much. Clay, you know, he just gave us so much. And I really struggled with, is it even right for us to cut our elders open and just let them bleed out their experiences so that we can learn? And I struggled with it. And so I tried to support him culturally. You know, we smudged. We made sure their family was there. We laughed and joked. Because, I mean, anybody that knows an Indian, there's more jokes at a funeral than anywhere else. We use humor as one of our strengths and our resilient things. And so we tried to make it light. But this is heavy stuff. And he's asked me almost every time I've talked to him, so did you find out? And I have not been able to find out. But I have an OPB researcher on it, and I'm hoping he's better than me. I actually have two people from OPB. One is a volunteer for Chelton High School who's looked into this for me 
and another is a man writing an article. And I'm hoping that we can someday answer Clay's questions. Um, the boarding schools went on for over 100 years. In the 1960s, there was this movement called the Civil Rights Movement, and they decided that segregated education was not in the best interest of the children. There's this case called Brown v. Board. 1954, everybody else let go of segregated education, except for Native Americans. Native Americans went all the way up through the 1980s almost in boarding schools. And the motto of the boarding schools has changed with Chamawa, that's not it. Chamawa is the longest running school. And it's no longer, students get to elect to go there. And it's ran with a good cultural foundation. But this stuff happened for over 100 years. And now, within the last six months, is when the mass graves have started to be uncovered. And the healing begins today for a better tomorrow. I truly believe that. It's going to be a researcher from this tribe that talks to their grandma and learns something that opens up the wound, that bleeds out, but then we're properly able to set it. And I think that's how we will heal from it. Because we hold on to our roots, but we dig into what's coming in our present and our future. And I, I use this example. I love this kid's rocket pants. He's got a cell phone. Job. <laughs> that shows how we can rock the past with the present into the future. I believe that's how Native people survive. We hold on to our culture and our roots, but we proceed into the future. And also, we have our first ever. Uh, not our first ever Native American office, but our first ever Secretary of the Interior in Deb Holland. And she did launch the boarding school initiative. And something that I think is hugely important, I don't like to come in and just give you sad history. I like to give you accurate history so you know where you came from and how truly strong you are. And so I think to fully grasp the magnitude of the people that you are descendants of, you have to know what all they went through. And don't forget, that includes resiliency and strength. And I added this last part, because Canada made me mad this week. <laughs> uh, there was a mayor in Canada that they were talking about the boarding schools and all the bodies of the children. And he said that we need to get over it, and we need to not have a chip on our shoulder. It made me mad. I was like, you have no right. And one of the way I think, we're not getting over it, but we are diving into our culture instead of going away from it. And so I added this video after hearing what that mayor said, because I think it's important. I want to say to all the young Michis out there, wear your hair long. For all the times that they cut our hair, speak your language for all the times that that was forbidden. Live your life to your fullest potential. Make your mind strong, your body strong, your spirit strong. Because when you do that, you will show the survivors the reward of what they have been fighting for all these years. I think it's important for us to learn our language. Because you know, I have shame in that I don't know my language. My grandma was fully fluent when she went to boarding school. She taught not a single word, not even the cuss words to her grandkids, you know? And it's, there's a reason. It was beaten out of them. And so if you have a language program, support that. If you have people diving back into their culture, whether it's the first time they've showed up at Payamsha or they're trying to grow their hair, support that because they're trying to find their way back home after being intentionally removed. And on September 30, 30th is our day of remembrance. You can wear orange on that to show allyship and to show support. Um, another thing I want to bring to your attention, if you haven't seen them, um, these are two videos that the tribe has put out. Both are kind of natural resource based. Um, the Rooted in Culture actually won a bunch of awards at film festivals. But these were done by Wahoo Productions and Ben, and I actually saw how good they were, so I stole your production company and used them to do my videos. <laughs> um, but they show your natural resources being rebuilt on a level I have never seen. And it's amazing, because this isn't something that happens in five years. This is like a 50-year project, and you guys are doing amazing. You're setting the bar for the rest of the tribes to know what to do. Um, and then here's some more uh, 
resources. This was the act that was just passed on September 30th. Um, this is the Boarding School Healing Coalition, and they actually have lessons in there. I am happy to leave this PowerPoint if anybody wants it and wants to tweak it, make it your own, um, and make it more specific to Warm Springs. This documentary is amazing. It's called Blood Memory Documentary, and she goes through um, boarding schools, and then she ties it into the Indian Child Welfare Act. This I actually had a Warm Springs student in my Native Studies class. We had to pay to watch this because I didn't have access to it. She's like, it's so good, I will give you my password to use it. And she <laughs> offered that to her whole entire classmates. That shows what a giving nature she had. The Michigan Public Library allows any card holder to have candy access to it. Yeah, and since then, at a cost of like three, four hundred bucks, COCC has paid for that and put it on the Canopy website. And it is an amazing documentary. Um, the This Land podcast, season one, is amazing. It talks about the McGirt decision, and I gotta tell you, the McGirt decision is where they got back 60% of Oklahoma. Chief Justice Gershon ended that opinion, and I can't talk about it without crying, with the line of, at the other side of the trail of tears, there was a promise. It is time the United States is held to its word. That's what the last Supreme Court decision coming out of it. The next thing going to the Supreme Court is going to be, is the Indian Child Welfare Act racist? If that falls, our tribal sovereignty will fall with it. If our tribal citizenship is based on race instead of citizenship, it is being attacked as being racist. That's going to be the next thing going to the Supreme Court. So I would be aware of these issues, because they're big. And then tribal history, shared history. The first time in our lives we are writing history from our perspective. And I gotta tell you, that is healing and that is powerful. So dig into that. And I know that you guys had input from your elders on that. Talk about gold. And then this just shows how hard it is to kind of research that because tribes don't have access to it. They have 1.5% of the records. So I think that's it. Yeah, and then all the people I talked to, Kevin Horton's OPB, this is the lady from Forest Grove, and this is the lady from Chamawa, who were able to help me. So catch up, thank you. Does anybody have any questions or anything? That was a lot, I had to talk fast. The museum in Hamilton, uh, next to the casino, uh, starts with the occupation of Alcatraz. Can you talk about the end of the process of the boarding school? Yeah. Um, the boarding schools were actually still going because that was, oh, I, don't, I, I think it's 1960, and they took over Alcatraz, and it was actually a student union out of San Francisco, and then AIM came in and took that over, and it was, I gotta love it. There, there's a line in the Fort Laramie Treaty that says any surplus government land is supposed to be returned to Native Americans. <laughs> so because these natives knew their rights. They went in and said, hey, Alcatraz is surplus land. Let me go ahead and take that off your hands. And they took it. And it became a media frenzy. Like, clean, clean it's clear water. Is that the name of the group? Sorry, I know. That's your generation. You're going to get mad and mess it up. They, like, bought a boat for these guys to travel back and forth out to the rock. And they, they took it over for almost a year. And then what they did when they left there was, I talk about marches, because you know, summer of 2019, summer 2019, 2020, we had a lot of marches. And Native people know how to march. They marched from Alcatraz all the way to Washington, D.C. with a list of demands, demanding that we be treated equal, that our treaty rights be followed through on. And it was started with that occupation of the rock. And I would say, even today, that's probably one of the things that the Natives are most well known for was taking that over. They also took over the VA office in Washington. Um, but the occupation of Alcatraz, it was probably one of native civil rights movement, probably one of our most pinnacle moments. And if you go back, they um, they put all the like, graffiti, they redo it. And they actually celebrate it on Thanksgiving, on Thanksgiving every year to acknowledge the occupation of the rock. And it's a cool story, you should look into it, it's a good one. But they had schools and it, uh, John Trudeau was there with his radio station. Yeah. What will you be doing with all of those elder interviews? Those elder interviews are going to hopefully be on our webpage. 
And I gotta say, it was the most powerful thing I have ever done. And my production company was like, you can't, people can't go for an hour. They'll only take 15, 20 minutes. And I felt really bad, because I can't tell an elder cook. <laughs> and I was like, oh, they won't go that long. And every single one of my elders went up to their time limit. And I think for a culture that thrives on respecting elders and listening to our elders, I think that right there told me we had been silencing our elders for too long. And I let them come in and I told them, I just wanted to come in and you know, complain about tribal government for an hour because that could happen. <laughs> um, I said, I want you to think about you know, the pivotal things that you want to pass on to the next generation and what you think is most important that was passed on to you. And so I focused them in that way. And then the ones that I knew were boarding school survivors, I really dug in there. But every single one of them went for an hour. And I was making three videos, one on boarding school, one on termination and restoration. And I said, we're going to listen to our elders. We're going to decide what the third video is after the interviews. And the bootleg buyer had just taken off. On June, it was July 16th that we did the interviews, 15th and 16th. And they got to the land, and they all teared up because their land was on fire. It was burning. And so our third video will be on mismanagement of resources and land back. And so we're going to use that third video to show our fish are dead and dying. Our land is on fire. Give it back so we can properly manage it. And so it was a really powerful thing. So I was like, oh, it'll probably be tribal government. And then what was most important to those elders is their land, which was taken. And they want it back. And they said, that's where we're going to go. And it wasn't the direct, it's not the easy direction to follow, but out of respect for them showing up and telling us what was important, that's what our next round of lessons will be on, and that's where our next goal is. And again, we have Walking Films that is doing our videos, so thanks for paving the road for us to come in and follow along. But we hope to have every single interview there, because it's hard to find interviews. Yes, sir? Do you have a website that we can follow your progress and keep track of? Um, I read their website. You can contact me anytime through the college. Um, but as soon as I get those up, they will come up through our Klamath Tribes webpage and through the education department. Our lessons were turned in mid-deadline, barely, of June 30th, but our lessons have not passed general counsel. So that general counsel is our whole voting body over 18. And so that's where our lessons are right now. And we're just waiting to add in our video component. Because we wanted, you know, uh, my cousin and I wrote all the lessons for free. So we could pay to have a production, a professional production company come in and record our elders. Because we lost six of them, six boarding school survivors since COVID started. And so, you know, you always say, oh, record your elders. Nothing like a pandemic that targets the elderly to make you actually but I will keep you posted, and as soon as I can get those up, because the weird thing, and it wasn't weird, but I had three people, three clan members from Madras come down and be recorded. You know, they get people dispersed. You know, we were terminated, so our people really did disperse more so than throughout some of the other tribes. And one of them um, married a warm springer who was then relocated to the Indian Relocation Program. I'm like, oh, come on again. Her, her husband, what a good story. What a good lesson. Um, I'll, I'll definitely, we'll have it on our webpage as soon as it's up. And again, if you, if I can ever assist in researching anything, I'm happy to do it, because it's it's not easy to find the history. And so you reach into the college at any time. Did you just feel like so many of these stories need to get out of the Native American culture and into the more mainstream, you know, to bring more attention to the cause and the chaos? I agree. Because, like, if we look at an issue like land back, we are going to only be able to do that through allyship. And if we're looking into legislation being passed to go out there and take infrared cameras to, you know, where the Warm Springs schools was, where the where the Klamath schools were, because there were Indian agents in every single place running these schools and these institutions that I don't believe had the best interests of Native people at heart. And so you have you know, a $10,000 piece of machinery with a technician to go and do that. We can't afford, there's rumors of mass graves in different places down in Klamath, but we, don't, we can't afford to have that 
research done. And it's only going to be through like an allyship with the U of O or something like that, or with bringing in community partners that will be successful in doing that. And so I do think that's why Senate Bill 13 is so powerful for two reasons. One, natives finally get to learn their own history. And two, non-natives get to learn an accurate history that my goal is to build empathy and through empathy comes understanding. Absolutely. You know? And so that's kind of the route. Because things are, you know, like our water issues are very hostile in Pamath County. And um, I feel if they understood the issues, maybe a little more, put themselves on the other side's shoes, and this goes for both sides then we could understand perspectives better and work together as a community. Because neither one of us are leaving. The tribe's not leaving and neither are the farmers. And so until we learn to successfully work together, our community is going to struggle. And so yeah, I agree. And I want those interviews on the web page because I've been trying to research stuff for forever and it's hard to find. You guys have a museum, you know? And so that can be a clearing house. And then I interviewed your guys' archives clerk. She's Klamath, one of your archives clerks and they're working to digitize your records. And so you're definitely ahead of the game, well, ahead of us. And you know it is a competition. <laughs> so, um, is there a way to work with OSU to create like a portal for Native American uh, studies and, and portal all that through? You know, I would hope so. I, I spent 13 years with the Oregon Judicial Department and I did their paperless tra uh, transition. You literally have to buy a uh, uh, like a warehousing and then you have to barcode everything and scan everything. Mm -hmm. So it can definitely be done. That's what Linda Bagley is doing with your guys' tribe, with the Warm Springs tribe. And so it can be done. I just think it's probably a $50,000 project. Again, you know, if OSU writes a grant and gives us some summer interns, our, our, our archive clerk is the cutest little old Indian lady, she's probably 85. Her name's Ruth Jackson and everything's thrown in boxes. And so, you know, if she got 10 summer interns, cleaned that up, scanned everything, then imagine what the next person that came along and wanted to research something could do. So, yeah. Excellent ideas. And I mean, I think they want to. It's just, we just haven't done it yet. Being, because our my tribe was terminated in 1954 and not restored until 80, 1980s. And so we lost that. All of our records were shipped off to National Archives. So we have none of our so we're, we're kind of in a different boat. Definitely on a to-do list. Anything else? Well, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>